Blur TV. Hello, hey, God, the Wolf. Hello, Jasper. Hello, Jasper. Where are you today? Aberystwyth by the Welsh coast. Yeah. And Brighton at the end of In England. <laughs> and straight into a nice first question. How did... Oh, straight to business, not even talking about our snacks. Oh, have you got some? I've got an apple and black currant bar. I've got mojito and I've tapped on my <laughs> CBD vape. Ja jam sandwich? Can you beat that? <laughs> no, we can't beat that. <laughs> oh, no, my son's back from school. I'm so sorry. Karen, you carry on. I'll carry on. Karen. This will be easier now, anyway. Um, how did Hagar the woman first get together? It was a very long time ago, and we kind of met each other at sixth form college. And we didn't really want to go to any of our lessons. And so we instead started going to see bands together and living together. And then we started going to the Walking Anarchy Centre. It was more like a punk rock youth club. That, that I recall. On a Sunday night it was. I'm sure there was heavy politicking going on around the sides and on Monday to Saturday. The number of bands were forming at that time and we thought, why won't, why shouldn't we? Why We've got something we? to say. Yeah, yeah. Be a visible woman. What am I drinking? A cup of Earl Grey tea. I'm drinking mojito because I'm a bit more loose than Ruth is. Where did the name come from? Oh, I made it up. It doesn't mean anything. It never did mean anything. However long it was since I made it up, regretting it. It's a biblical character. It's something to do with surrogacy. Yeah, we found that out later. People kept sending us little clips saying, did you know that you're in the Bible? No. <laughs> Did you know you're a part of a cartoon strip in the sun or the mirror or whatever it was? No. Did you know you're named after some heavy rock outfit? No. So all of these had H-A-G-A-R in common. We regret it. Oh, it's a great name. It makes people ask that mm -hmm. question. What was it like being a female Anaco punk band in the early days? It, it did feel like there weren't as many of us, which I think in a way made us more determined to do it. And actually we did start off trying to be a women only band, but we couldn't find enough women who played instruments. And the, the women we gathered together, not all of us, man, I was going to be the drummer and I realised I had no sense of rhythm, so I couldn't become a drummer. And we, we seemed to acquire more and more female vocalists, but couldn't get quite enough female musicians, which is why we had to get some men in, sadly and they kind of stuck with us as well. But I think we just really felt that we should have a turn too. We saw amazing things like Vice Versa from the Poison Girls, there was Rubella Ballet. And so there were people out, there were women out there, but there weren't as many, but I just think that made us more determined to do it. us notice but also we got quite a lot of stick particularly as we started off not really being able to do anything or play anything and just had attitude and I think we were to some extent regarded as silly little girls yeah attitude weren't enough was it because <laughs> <laughs> what kind of what kind of stick did you get oh it was like silly little girls and because we weren't dressed in black all the time because we kind of love jumble sales and second-hand shops and, and stuff like that. And we just put our own bits of clobber together. And it wasn't very uniform. And it seems funny to think that in these old anarcho-punk days, there would have been anything like a, a uniform to conform or fit in. But it was said the majority of us and the people around us um, largely wore black. And when we didn't, we, it was easier to point at us. We stood out a little bit more and we weren't 
considered part of this so-called norm at the time. But it, sound, it sounds to me, it sounds to me like maybe at the same time, boys who didn't quite fit in didn't seem to get so much criticism. It's a funny. I go back to the punk rock youth club because we were sixteen, seventeen year olds, and it felt like a lot of the time that the boys around us hadn't sort of quite mastered the art of speaking to girls and <laughs> and enacting with them in certain ways other than their sort of irritating little sisters maybe or um I don't know you know it, it just felt there was an age dimension where if you compared it to now obviously that doesn't exist anymore and we feel very much more equal now than than we did then definitely but I also think it got us noticed as well because there were less of us and there was a certain element of, oh, we should have some women performers on the bill. You know, we should encourage some diversity. So, you know, it went, although it did work against us in other ways, it worked for us. But there was almost a sense sometimes of, oh, well, let's just get one band with women on the bill and then we'll look a bit more diverse. And so there wasn't there wasn't much of a sense yeah. like there are today of amazing female promoters who have all women festivals and things like that. There wasn't that. It was more of a sense of, oh, well, we've stuck one on the bill. <laughs> That'll do. <laughs> Hang on, quick time for a bit of, a bit of Lester. Mm. What's your snack, Jasper? You'll like this one. Uh, You've I'll... got a variety. Can you see that? Oh. Hey, pulled over. I can see you holding something in chunks. I can see you holding something. I can't see your trees. <laughs> <laughs> um, pulling all the stops out for Hagar the womb on the snacks. Um, Thank you. Roasted beetroot hummus. With mint. <gasps> and Oh, that sounds very nice. Well, I don't know what it's like. That is showing off. And, yes. Yeah, well. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you, and um, veggie sausage. Tell me about the toilets. <laughs> right, so the toilets at Wapping were basically um, the, they were the where in that we formed in the toilets, but they were also our HQ. And why they were our HQ is we kind of got ignored in the general thrust of the whopping setup and we retreated to the toilets because um as i said um for girls the toilets are a gig at a gig are a bit of a stronghold anyway um and they definitely were for us that's where we had all our meetings and our discussions about what was going on beyond those doors We've got lots of lovely, lovely pictures of us in the, it, various people sitting by the cisterns in, in Whopping <laughs> Anarchy Centre. And so it's very much a sense of where we started with the toilets. Smash the cistern. What was it like doing the John Peel sessions? It was a little bit torturous um, in that we were relying on equipment on the day that never turned up. But to backtrack, he asked us on air whether we'd come in and do a session. And it was a double take, really. Like, did we really hear that? So we were absolutely overjoyed because obviously he, he was an idol. So we had... Uh, the shenanigans on the day and then what did the producer say Karen and the producer over. said that we were the most incompetent people he'd ever had in the studio <laughs> and so I do remember at the time feeling very inadequate and very you know although we were really really overexcited we were also made to feel that this person I think he produced quite a lot of prog rock and stuff like that obviously was not used to such incompetent people and I then also sang backing vocals on a three john's um, John Peel session with him as well and he was he was slightly less rude to the three Johns but I think also what I really remember was how cheap the food was in the canteen and we were living in a squat together and we just whenever we weren't recording we just went back to the canteen and ate as much food as we possibly could and so this excitement of being in a great institution very cheap food but then slight embarrassment that we you know that they did seem to think we were really incompetent and they took fuck out of Song of Deep Hate. We weren't allowed to say fucking hate. We had to say hate, hate, hate. 
And it took us ages to get <laughs> our tongues round hate, hate, hate when we weren't used to doing it. So they, they came down heavy on us. I remember then I saw him at a gig, John Peel, about a month later and ran up screaming, going, thank you, thank you. And he looked terrifying and terrified and said, I must go to the toilet. And he never reappeared again. So I think he was, he seemed to be, by all accounts, very shy and he didn't like people coming up and talking to him. And I thought, think the thought of someone with a big Mohican coming up and thanking him was too much and he hid from me. Why did you split up? Was it to do with the Mekons, Karen? It, you see, people left at different times, so there wasn't one grand split. But I think, did you and Mitch go when we oh, wouldn't me play? Mitch, me and Mitch had a big fight with the rest of the band about playing gig with the Three Johns. And I think it was oh. at Dingwalls, it was somewhere. And we decided, you know, I don't know why, um, that we didn't want to play a gig that was more than pound fifty, And so we stormed off. We were having principles, Karen. We're not going to split up all over again, but the rest of the band were having principles. <laughs> and there was a threshold over which we wouldn't play if people were charged over that threshold. Yeah. But the Three Johns were your and Mitch's favourite band. <laughs> I think that was I think that was the thing that caused and so we stormed off and we were very cross I mean I think we really regretted it afterwards but also we'd lived in a squat together we'd played gigs every week for years and years and I think it just got a bit too much didn't it and I think we needed a rest I didn't quite anticipate we'd need a 25 year rest <laughs> I think it did just all become a bit too much um, so that kind of leads on to more like the present day do you do many gigs in other countries uh well for example you played in oakland didn't you recently yeah that, that was the first time ever in america and we love oakland we stayed in a wonderful house with chickens called <laughs> called bitty and um and some famous american actress who i can't remember now um and the people were wonderful it was wonderful being over there but um it was only the first time in all our history, the first time round, we didn't get further than Holland. So to get to America um, was pretty major, really. It was a wonderful experience because we didn't realise it was headlining a golf festival and the lovely women who organised it, what we didn't realise at the time when we went to play was that the two of them fundraised for a year to pay for our plane tickets. We had no idea about the amount of work they got to get us over there and put on the festival. They were absolutely lovely. There. It was a joy to play there. And if anyone ever gets the chance to play there, the Near Dark Festival in Oakland, I would highly recommend. I was just going to name drop them, Karen. Here's to Near Dark. OK, your songs tackle hard-hitting political issues. How do they come together, these songs? Well, I, I'll write about something that irks me. Um, but we've all written or all, all done some music for lyrics. Um, it's, it's very organic. Not one person does it, or not even two or three people. Mitch has just sent me a new tune over in, I say oh. just, in the last six months of lockdown here you are put some lyrics to it and i'm just so slow other people have written probably four albums worth in all this time um and i think that i'd like to write about cognitive dissonance next but i haven't <laughs> got further than that mild thought and mitch's um lovely tune sitting there waiting in a file on my emails um Karen, how would you, what would you say in answer to this? Well, I've only written a few songs and they have, but yeah, they've been out of experiences of things that have happened to me. Like I wrote a song called Showing Off, where I was asking about why I was in a band again. And I was kind of being quite brave and admitting that I thought one of the main reasons I was in a band again was to get away from my family and go and have fun rather than because I believed in in a lot of political stuff. I've also got a song that I've been kicking around and need to get out there, which is called A Motherfucker, which is all about people calling someone just a mother. And what I'm lucky about is my partner plays bass. And so what I do is if I've written something, I, I go upstairs and even though he's a bit of a mod, I've made him write the tunes. So I'm quite lucky I have my own 
tunesmith in my own house we've kind but... of got a mixture now of old songs that we had from the old days and then much newer songs that reflect things that we're more concerned about more interested in because i think we wanted to have a mixture we knew that people would want to hear some of our old songs but we didn't want to stay stuck in just playing those ones we had new things that we wanted to sing about so i think we've got a quite good balance of kind of old and new and kind of are going to carry on writing songs because I think otherwise you don't really have the challenge when you play if you just kept playing the same songs all the time. Although there, there is a buzz I have to say from watching the audience singing yes. your songs better than and knowing the lyrics more than you do um, which was definitely our experience in Oakland and the first time we, pay, we played Paris when we came back as well was just watching these people all around us singing along to the songs and us looking at our lyric sheets to try and play catch up with them. That was the, the weirdest thing. So anyway. You know, it's the realisation that they buy your records and they know all your words. And like some of these people wouldn't have even been born when we actually brought the record out. And you're right, the Oakland was very much like the, the scene in Spinal Tap where they go and play in Japan and everyone knows all the words to all the Spinal Tap songs. That's what it felt like in America because they knew all the words to our songs where we don't. <laughs> <laughs> Super. Final thoughts for any girl for any girls watching who want to form a punk band. Can I just say <laughs> no I'm, that sounds so final. I don't mean it to, but I remember when we were 16 and 17 and we were accosting poor vice versa and saying, when we grow up, we want to be just like you. And I think now when we hear that, we think, well, actually, you know, we're not that old. So God knows what she felt at the time. But um, it's always inspiring to have people coming up and, and saying that to you when you knew that you were in that position once yourself. I would say do it you get to have a good time you get to go to lots of different countries make a fool of yourself in lots of different places meet people you would never meet in any other way and so yeah don't be embarrassed to make an ass of yourself on stage don't, don't expect a boyfriend oh god no i never got a shag out of it no no <laughs> it's not a route to sex it's not a route to money but you'll have a good time i can agree with you <laughs> yeah. no sex no money that's a wrap, isn't it? Come on. Oh, you. You are. Do you know what? In <laughs> honour of this, this is the first time I've put makeup on since the first lockdown. Same here. And brushed um, my hair. <laughs> I've had a shave. I put a bra on. I plucked my chin for this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> wonderful. I also surprised by how much I miss it. I watched the footage of Glastonbury and I cried all the way through because I'm, I act really miss the experience of being on stage. Yeah. We may be spending a lot of money going to Birmingham to play <laughs> 25 minutes, but I really miss that 25 minutes and I really wish it could come back as soon as possible. Yeah, there's a ball. Oh, no!